morning. We're going to get started. Everybody knows we have a midterm on Friday, yes? Yes. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions about the midterm? At the end of class today, I will say how much of Chapter 3 will be on the midterm. All right. Questions? Anybody? Yes. Excuse me? Like constitutional isomers? Possibly, yes. More questions? <coughs> yeah. No special Scantron. We don't, I don't really do multiple choice too much. OK? Um, up at the top here, there's, um, there's a, under the practice link on the website, there's a, a approximate PKA expanded. There's eight PKAs that you need to memorize. All right, so if you need, so there's, there's, there's three types of problems. Ones where you would use the um, approximate PKAs, those eight. Ones where I would provide you PKAs or ones where I'm looking for structure and acidity and you wouldn't have PA, PKAs for those. All right, so maybe plan on all three types of problems. So I may give you two, two or three PKAs and that's it. All right, more questions. Okay, we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. Most of this stuff has been talked about in GCHEM, so this should hopefully be mostly review for you. All right, so uh, intermolecular forces, the interactions between molecules, what's the strongest intermolecular force? Well, if there's intermolecular forces between ions and there's intermolecular forces between covalent bonds. So what's the strongest of all of those? Ionic. And then between covalent bonds, it's what? Hydrogen bonds. And then underneath that is dipole-dipole and then um, van der Waals. Okay, so these are the three we're going to talk about. We'll do van der Waals forces uh, first. Van der Waals forces are very weak interactions caused by temporary dipoles when molecules approach each other. You can have um, van der Waals forces between all, to all types of covalent molecules. So, um, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's pretty much this, the only interaction when you have non-polar non molecules. Okay, so as they approach each other, this is what it looks like. Two molecules are approaching each other here, and there, there's no dipole at all. As they get closer, we get electron-electron repulsion from the electron clouds as they approach each other. So what the molecules do is they form a temporary dipole. They move electron density to one end of the molecule. So this end here is going to have a partial negative charge. And then now this end will be, have a partial positive charge. And they do that in such a way that they'll line up so they'll be attracted. The partial negative and the partial positive will be attracted. And down here, the partial positive here, attracted to the partial negative. Um, then they collide. And as they move apart, this distortion goes away. And when they're, when they're far apart, then we go back to no dipole at all. So it's a temporary induced dipole. So let's label this a little bit, the molecules approach. So that's the first thing that happens. As they get close, electron clouds distort. We call this an induced dipole. And then the third thing we get is collision. And notice that the dipoles are aligned for attraction. Then the molecules move apart. As they move apart, the further they get apart, then that, that distortion of the electron cloud is going to go away. 
And so here in the, in the fifth thing here, the molecules separate. And the induced dipoles are gone. This tends to be a really weak attraction unless you have a very high molecular weight. When you have a very high molecular, molecular weight, this can become a very large attraction. All right. Two important factors that affect the strength of Van der Waals forces. The first one is surface area. The larger the surface area, the larger the attractive force. And that's why large molecules are going to have large Van der Waals attractions. There's also polarizability, and we're going to talk more about this in just a minute. Um, this is a measure of how the electron cloud around an atom responds to changes. So pretty much how distortable is that electron cloud? We have this distortion that's happening there, and some molecules do this distortion a little bit better than other molecules. And so we're going to talk about that again coming up, but um, just to give you an idea, if we have fluoride, for example, that's not a very polarizable. Uh, our, our analogy for a fluoride is like a billiard ball. So the electron clouds are not very, dis not, not very polarizable. So fluoride's like a billiard ball. Iodine, on the other hand, very large and very polarizable. So iodine's like a fluffy pillow. So imagine if you had to distort a fluffy pillow, easy to do. Imagine if you had to distort a billiard ball, you would not be able to do it. So yeah. Is there an example where the surface area is small but it has high polarizability? We're going to look at that coming up when we look at some specific examples. All right, so that's um, Van der Waals forces. We have uh, also dipole-dipole interactions, molecules with permanent dipoles. And so we'll just do you know, some little schematics here. There's a, there's a molecule with a permanent dipole, and they're going to line up so that the permanent dipoles are aligned so that we have positive next to negative. And it can do this different ways. So I'm always putting the positive end of the dipole next to the negative end of another one. So you can imagine how this works. <coughs> This is going to be a stronger effect because these are not induced by dipoles, they're permanent dipoles. And so as a result, they're stronger than Van der Waals forces, but not as strong as ionic or, va or covalent bonds. And then the, the, the third um, type of interaction is a hydrogen bonding. It occurs when a hydrogen atom bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So we have to have a hydrogen bonded to oxygen or a hydrogen bonded to nitrogen or a hydrogen bonded to fluorine. And so this, high, this, this is um, electrostatically attracted to a lone pair on, of, of electrons on an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine atom in another molecule. So um, hydrogen bonds are the strongest type of intermolecular attraction in covalent uh, molecules, but they are much weaker than a covalent bond. So there is a tendency, a misconception for students to think that a hydrogen bond is a real bond. It's not a real bond. It's an intermolecular attraction. And just to give you an idea of how it can't be a real bond, let's look at the, um, usually draw it with dots. That's certainly the way I draw it. There's a hydrogen bond. So we have the hydrogen bonded to oxygen. And then it's attracted to the oxygen on another molecule. The other molecule doesn't necessarily have to have actually a hydrogen bonded to oxygen. It just has to have an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So we call this the um, donor. And this the acceptor. So the donor is the one that needs hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine 
the acceptor needs, just needs um, an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine. Doesn't necessarily have to have a hydrogen attached. In this particular molecule, we have a hydrogen bonding amongst mo molecules of water. So they both, they both can act in both ways. Um, but the one who, the one, the molecule that has the hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine is the donor, and the one that's accepting that hydrogen bond is the acceptor. And so just to give you an idea of the strength of this bond, here's our hydrogen bond here. Delta H naught is about 5 to 6 kcals per mole. Well, not 5.6, 5 to 6. It's going to vary depending on whether you have an oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine, but that's the average. And um, the approximate bond length is 1.8 to 1.9 angstroms. You do not need to memorize these numbers. Let's compare that with a covalent hydrogen-oxygen bond. So this is a hydrogen bond between hydrogen and oxygen. Here's a covalent bond. Delta H naught is 104 kcals per mole. And approximate bond length, 0.96 angstroms. 0.96 angstroms for bond length. And we know that the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. So this is not in the same category at all of, of a, a covalent bond. It is not a covalent bond, so we never want to draw this with a solid line. It's a hydrogen bond, so much, much weaker, much, much longer. So again, the numbers you don't need to memorize. I just want you to understand the difference between a hydrogen bond and a covalent bond. All right, so on the next page, we talk about the hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. The strongest linear all hydrogen bonds are linear. The two electronegative atoms and the hydrogen between them lie in a straight line, and that's what we have here. But there are other types. Uh, but that's the strongest type. Linear here, the hydrogen in the middle being in a straight line. All right, so these intermolecular attractions is, are what actually give us our physical properties for covalent molecules. So it's, the strength of them is going to dictate boiling point, melting point, all, um, solubility, all those things. So we'll talk about boiling point first. Boiling point is the temperature at which a liquid is converted to a gas. And so you can imagine in, in order for a molecule to vaporize, you've got, the, the, you, you've got the molecules together, closely associated, so you have to pull those molecules apart. If, uh, it requires a lot, if they have really strong intermolecular attractions, you're going to have a high boiling point. You're going to have to put in a lot of energy to pull those molecules apart. If there's not a very strong intermolecular attraction, then um, it's going to be very easy and we'll have a low boiling point. So again, so molecules are held together by strong forces. It takes a lot of energy to pull molecules apart. And therefore, we're going to have a high boiling point. If molecules are held together by weak forces, then it takes little energy. <laughs> to pull molecules apart. And you're going to have a low boiling point. So if you have a molecule that's a gas at room temperature, that means it's not being held together by very strong intermolecular attractions. So it's very easy for those molecules to be uh, apart. Ionic compounds are held together by the strongest of these forces. They have very high boiling points. So sodium chloride, 
we never really talk about the boiling point of sodium chloride because it, it's huge, uh, 1,413 degrees cent Celsius. We talked about hydrofluoric acid sort of being on the borderline between almost being covalent, the pKa difference being 1.8. We know that hydrofluoric acid is not an ionic compound. So uh, because it doesn't have any of the properties of an ionic compound, but just for comparison's sake, uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, has a boiling point of 156 degrees centigrade. So it's nowhere near uh, the properties of an ionic compound. With covalent molecules, boiling point is going to depend on functional groups present. We're going to be talking about, we already talked about functional groups, surface area, and polarizability. So functional groups, size, surface area, and polarizability. We're going to have to look at um, all of those things. For compounds of approximately the same molecular weight, and this is important, approximately the same molecular weight. We have an increasing intermolecular forces to the right. So van der Waals, compounds with dipole-dipole, stronger compounds with hydrogen bonding. So increasing strength, of intermolecular forces. And increasing boiling point. But it's important that we talk about compounds with approximately the same molecular weight because I can give you a compound that does hydrogen bonding and I can give you a compound that's completely nonpolar that will have a higher boiling point if it's very large, okay? So it's a, it's a, you really have to compare things that are close to each other. So simple hydrocarbons held together by the we relatively weak van der Waals forces and therefore they typically have very low boiling points. So four carbon chain, <coughs> boiling point minus 0 0.5 degrees. We add a carbon it jumps up to 36.1 degrees. These are all Celsius, of course. If we put a branch in, so we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, but branched, the boiling point drops, 27.9 degrees. If we do a double branch, this still has five carbons, it drops again down to nine. Okay, and that has to do with surface area. So if you can imagine, we'll, we'll approximate this for a carbon chain like this. That would be the surface area. Because remember, the van der Waals attractions is, is we have induced dipoles where those two encounter each other. So if there's a large surface area, there's going to be a large area for that um, attractive force to happen. This guy's a little bit longer. So we have more surface area. So more surface area. Therefore more van der Waals attractions. When we start to branch, then we decrease the surface area. And when we've got here, we've got, the, the, uh, we've got one branch here. We've got two branches here. And when we have two branches, this molecule is essentially round. So, so what it would look like is this. And you see the small amount of surface area that the two have in common? So very, very little area here where you're going to see these attractions. So uh, round like a ball. So um, therefore, very small surface area. The sphere has the lowest surface to volume ratio of any 3D object. So that's that you're, we're barely getting any contact here. And that's why the, melting, the, the boiling point is dropping. <coughs> if we go all the way over here, we have a boiling point Gosh, this is an octadecane, boiling point 317 degrees. 
melting point 28 to 30. Huge molecule, a lot of surface area, so the van der Waals attractions can actually become pretty, pretty large when we have a large molecule. Notice there's a regular increase in boiling point with increasing molecular weight. If we increase the chain length, we call this a carbon chain, by the way. If we increase the chain length, we increase the surface area. And therefore, we increase the van der Waals attractions. And branching is going to minimize surface area. It's going to make the molecule more small, smaller and more compact. And that's going to affect the uh, surface area for van der Waals attractions. Ethers generally have higher boiling points than alkanes of comparable molecular weight because they have van der Waals forces and dipole dipole because they do have a permanent dipole. So if we compare, remember we're being very careful to compare approximately the same molecular weight. So this ether here, this is dimethyl ether minus 23.7 and uh, this is minus 42.1. So higher boiling point here because we have actually a permanent dipole, which means we can have dipole-dipole attractions. So similar molecular weight. This one here, the ether has dipole-dipole <coughs> plus van der Waals. And this one has van der Waals only. Now let's add a carbon to see if this still works here. Regular increase in boiling point with increase in molecular weight. Let's add one carbon. This jumps up to 10, 10.8 10 degrees. And this is minus 0 0.5 without oxygen. So same idea here, we have similar molecular weight. This one here, dipole, dipole. Plus van der Waals. And this one here, four carbon chain, uh, van der Waals only. Question. Um, so, what about if molecules have, like, they could either be written like, in, um, or they could either like, have a structure of like a chain or an aromatic group. So that change there? That's going to affect the polarizability. We'll talk about that coming up. Yeah, good question. All right. Alcohols and amines have much higher boiling points because they can do hydrogen bonding. Right? Again, we're comparing with similar molecular weight. So I'll be careful if I ask you trends, if I ask you, I will ask you on <coughs> boiling point trends on the exam and I will be careful to not trick you by doing something that's really large and something, you know, I try to keep the molecular weight about the same. So we have uh, boiling point minus 161.7, that's methane, so natural gas, water 100 degrees, ammonia minus 33.35 degrees centigrade, so ammonia is a gas at room temperature. So um, methane has um, van der Waals only, water has all three van der Waals plus hydrogen bonding plus dipole dipole. And really what hydrogen bonding is is a particularly strong dipole dipole <coughs> attraction. That's really what it is. Ammonia has also all three van der Waals plus hydrogen bonding, plus dipole-dipole. Dipole. 
Why is it lower? Why is ammonia lower? Yeah, it's the electronegativity. It's not as polar as a bond. Because if you think of hydrogen bonding as a very strong dipole-dipole, the, the nitrogen-hydrogen bond is not as polar as the oxygen-hydrogen bond. So it isn't going to be as strong. All right, so because primary means um, have two nitrogen-hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonding is more important for primary means than secondary means. Tertiary means don't hydrogen bond. <coughs> well, let's look. Um, so here's an example here. This is a primary amine. <coughs> That means we have one R group. So remember, we're using that R group for hydrocarbon chains. This has one R groups. This is a secondary amine. It has two R groups. And this is a tertiary amine. It has three R groups. And we're trying to stick with approximately the same molecular weight. This is 104 degrees. This is 90. It only has one nitrogen-hydrogen bond, so it's going to have less extensive hydrogen bonding, so the lower boiling point. This one here is 66. Why is that one lower? It's rounded, but more importantly, yeah, it is. That's true. What is, what is it missing? That, it can't do hydrogen bonding because there's no hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, right? So no uh, hydrogen bonding. So yes, it is more round. That's going to lower it too. Um, so that has two things that are working here to bring that boiling point down. Um, the biggest thing here is that there is no hydrogen bound to nitrogen. So uh, no hydrogen bonding for the tertiary amine. Questions? Anybody? Yes? What's that three degrees That's for tertiary. We're going to talk about that more in, in, later on, but that means tertiary. Yeah. It looks, it's a degree symbol, but we call it, we say tertiary, so primary, secondary, tertiary. All right, so both Van der Waals forces and dipole dipole interactions must be overcome for an alkyl halide to boil. So if we look here, here's our dipole moments for the carbon chlorine, carbon fluorine, carbon bromine, carbon iodine bond, minus 78.4 for methyl fluoride, minus 24.2 for methyl chloride, 3.6, and 42.4. So why does methyl fluoride boil at a lower temperature than methyl iodide, even though it's, it has a larger dipole moment? <coughs> it's much, much larger. It's also extremely polarizable. We're going to talk about that right here. Uh, but um, you see how, although we have similar no number of atoms, this one's much larger. So now van der Waals is becoming even more important than dipole-dipole in this particular instance, because we have a really large molecular weight. So. Um, Two reasons iodine is much larger than fluorine. So we have iodine here. Van der Waals radii is a measure of the approximate size of that iodine. Van der Waals radii is 2.5, fluorine 1.35. So greater van der Waals contact area. <coughs> Therefore, greater van der Waals attractions. So that's probably the most noticeable thing is just the size of the iodine. Not so obvious is the polarizability. And we're going to use polarizability a couple places here in, in um, this year. So it's an important concept here. So we said before fluorine, billiard ball.
electrons held very tightly. It's so electronegative, those electrons are pulled in really close and it's, it, it's very, it's not very polarizable at all. Iodine, if you can imagine, we're in, now in the fifth row of the periodic table. Those electrons are very, very far from that positively charged nucleus, so they're going to be much more, they're held much less tightly, and, they're, and, and so that's going to allow them to contort more easily. Electrons loosely held. For two reasons, iodine has a low electronegativity and um, the nucleus the, and the positively charged nucleus is much further away. So as a result, the electron cloud is more easily distorted. And therefore, we have greater induced dipoles. So we, we saw with that induced a dipole that the molecule moves electron density to one side of the molecule, and iodine can do that really well. So iodine is going to have a much greater partial positive and a much greater partial negative charge. Um, so it's going to have stronger van der Waals attractions. All right, so the following example shows that the rule of hydrogen bonds always being stronger than dipole-dipole attractions isn't always true. So here's an example here. We have very similar molecular weights. So I'm going to give you this across the top. Molecular weight, 46.07, 45.09, very close, 42.04. And now let's do dipole moment. One point six nine to buys. One point two two. Three point nine two. Remember cyanide? See carbon triply bonded to a nitrogen have an extremely large dipole. We kind of want to tuck that away and remember that. So here it's coming up again. What is the boiling point? 78. So we could do hydrogen bonding. That's an alcohol. 16.6. 16 so lower um, boiling point because nitrogen doesn't form as strong as hydrogen, hydrogen bonds. And this one here is uh, 80 to 81 to 82. And that can't even hydrogen bond with itself. So can't hydrogen bond, yet has the highest boiling point. And of course, the reason is this huge dipole moment right here. So is that an exception to the trend? Mm-hmm. Huge dipole moment. Therefore, very large dipole-dipole attraction. And if a hydrogen bond is simply a very strong dipole-dipole attraction, then this is in that same category. It's forming a very large dipole-dipole attraction. So, so even these lesser ones, we always think of hydrogen bonding being the best, but if we have a large molecule, van der Waals can be a, a stronger um, force than a hydrogen bond even, depending on the size of the, of the uh, molecule. Questions? Anybody? Yes? Uh, 
Hey, Cal, why don't, yeah, you, you use two kilojoules per, I, I don't know, just tradition? That's a good question. Kilojoules per mole, we usually use kcals per mole. I'm pretty much calibrated to kilocals per mole because that's what I used. And I find that most of the our organic chemistry textbooks also do. So it must be an OCHEM thing. Yeah, no, no good answer for that. Um, all right, melting point. Temperature with a solid is converted into a liquid. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. No big surprise here. Given the same functional group, the more symmetrical the molecule, the higher the melting point. Why? Uh, the reason here is that symmetrical molecules pack better in a crystal lattice. All right, so here's some examples here. We go from these straight here, and then we have a branch, and then we have two branches. We looked at boiling points here. Let's look at melting point. Minus 130, minus 160, minus 17. So more symmetrical. therefore higher melting point. And really, um, so, so, so melting point can give you some strange things. There's actually, if you plot the trends for uh, two carbon, uh, three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, six carbon, seven, and you do that whole thing, the, if there's an odd number, it's a lower melting point than if there's an even number. So it gets pretty complicated. We're not going to get too hardcore on melting point. But just, just to think about the fact that it's all about, if I, if I gave you, if I gave you um, 100 of these and had you pack them into a box, how efficiently could you pack those into a box? Um, here you could pack these a lot, a lot more efficiently here. So, that, so because you can pack them more efficiently, you can fit more in that space. They're going to be closer together, and you're going to have a higher melting point. Okay? But again, melting point can give you um, weird things that you don't expect, like the trend for even and odd. So I don't do too much with melting point. But what we can say is the same thing we talked about with boiling point is that for compounds of approximately the same molecular weight, we have the same trend increasing strength of intramolecular forces. And increasing melting point. And of course, the strongest is going to be ionic bonding here, and so that would be over here to the right. And those are going to have the really much, much high, higher melting points than any covalent molecules. All right, questions on melting point? Anybody? All right, let's talk about uh, solubility. Solubility, um, the extent to which a compound called a solute dissolves in a liquid called the solvent. So the big thing we need to know here, which I'm sure most of you already know, polar and ionic compounds are soluble in polar solvents. Nonpolar compounds are soluble in nonpolar or weakly polar solvents. So just the whole idea, oil and water don't mix. Oil is a hydrocarbon. You may not know that. Hydrocarbon, therefore nonpolar. And certainly water is polar. And so oil and water don't mix. Like dissolves like. So hydrogen bonding is important in determining solubility of organic compounds, molecules that can participate in hydrogen bonding. With water will dissolve in water if the nonpolar part of the molecule the part made up of carbon-hydrogen bonds is not too large. So general guidelines. An organic compound is water-soluble if it contains one hydrogen bond acceptor for every five carbon atoms. 
So even if an organic compound can't, doesn't have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, it can accept a hydrogen bond. So we would need an oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. As long as we have one for every five carbon atoms, we, we tend to have some uh, water solubility. Compounds considered soluble when three grams of solute dissolves in 100 mils of solvent. All right, so let's here, look at some examples here. So these are all compounds that actually can be hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. They have a hydrogen bonded to oxygen, all, all four of these. So ethanol, we have one oxygen and two carbons. This is miscible, which means it uh, mixes with water in all proportions. Now we jump up to how many carbons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons, one oxygen. That's going to not be very soluble, right? So we have a polar hydrophilic hydroxyl, hydrophilic or water loving. Portion, and that actually can donate and um, accept a hydrogen bond. But we've got this nonpolar portion here that's pretty large. So this is nonpolar hydrophobic. Or water fearing. So this is uh, 0.59 grams in 100 mils of water. So definitely falls below our solubility rule, which is 3 grams in 100 mils of solvent. Not surprising. Let's see about this one. One, two, three, four. Carbons in one oxygen, we have 9.1 milliliters in 100 mils of water. So definitely soluble. Taking those four carbons and kind of condensing them into a certain, and, and so adding branching, so that hydrophobic portion is actually smaller in size, and we get miscible. And that's because the more soluble because branching minimizes contact surface of nonpolar portion. So more soluble because branching minimizes the contact surface. of the nonpolar portion. All right, so again, all of these guys can donate and accept hydrogen bonds. If we have compounds that can't donate a hydrogen bond but just can accept it, then that's going to help their uh, solubility in water. So here's an example here. We have an ether can accept a hydrogen bond from water because it contains an oxygen. Likewise, this one can also accept a hydrogen bond from water. What about this last one here? Can that accept a hydrogen bond? Does not contain nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Therefore, it can't accept a hydrogen bond. (laughs) 
So uh, 7.9 grams dissolves in 100 mils of water, so that passes our solubility rule. Here we have 1.9 grams dissolves in 100 mils of water. Again, um, it's going to it can accept a hydrogen bond. It's not going to be as soluble because we've added a carbon. And this one here, 0 0.036 grams in 100 mils of water, we would call that insoluble. So here, hydrogen bond acceptor. This is also a hydrogen bond acceptor. But the hydrocarbon portion is larger. Therefore, it's less soluble. And so we're, we're really right on the borderline here. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons and one oxygen. So this is sort of what we need to have some water solubility. Um, so this is somewhat soluble, slightly soluble, but it's not, it's not completely soluble. All right, what about alkyl halides? They have some polar character, but only the alkyl fluorides have an atom that can form a hydrogen bond. So let's see how these solubilities are going to compare. So we'll draw the, our hydrogen bond here. It's going to help this water solubility of this alkyl fluoride. So this one here is very soluble. I don't have numbers here. Slightly soluble for the chlorine. And all of the rest of these slightly soluble. So very small amount will be soluble in water. Questions on water solubility? What I want to do is I want to skip a couple pages and come back to them on Wednesday. So the next page is applications, biomolecules. I'm not testing you on that. So I want to save that to Wednesday. What I am going to test you on is functional groups and reactivity. We've already mostly talked about this, so we're just re, kind of readdressing it here. Functional groups determine the reactivity of a molecule. All functional groups contain a heteroatom, pi bond, or both. We've already talked about that. These features make um, the electron deficient carbon and electron rich nucleophilic sites in the molecule. So electronegative heteroatom like nitrogen, oxygen, or X makes carbon electrophilic. We've talked about this already. So I just want to re-hit this point here at the end of this chapter. So this bond is polarized here in that direction. So that chlorine creates an electrophilic site. Remember, if we did an electrostatic potential map, that carbon would be in blue meaning it's electron deficient. It's electrophilic site. And so this is where nucleophiles are going to attack. Nucleophiles attack here. So remember, nucleophiles red, very electron rich, are going to attack the blue parts of the molecule. A lone pair on a heteratom makes it basic and nucleophilic. We've already talked about that. Basic and nucleophilic. And this nitrogen here, also basic and nucleophilic. So an ether is basic and nucleophilic because of the oxygen, and an amine is basic and nucleophilic because of the nitrogen and the lone pair on the nitrogen. There's an important exception to this rule, and that's hydronium ion. It is not nucleophilic, and also not basic. So if you're, if you're just blindly looking for lone pairs in a molecule, you'd say a couple things here. This is going to really throw you off. You'd say, okay, that oxygen has a lone pair, so it's basic and nucleophilic. And it has a positive charge, so it's um, electrophilic. One atom being all those things, so it's, it's going to throw you off. Um, so it's not nucleophilic or basic, and I'll show you why. 
So here's electrophile here. This is generic electrophile. E plus. So that's how I write a generic electrophile. If this, if this lone pair on oxygen attacks an electrophile or if it attracts, attacks a generic acid, you're already familiar with HA for generic acid, we get something that we know is not going to be something that we want to draw. Have you ever seen oxygen with four bonds? Has a two plus charge. Remember our rule for this class is we never write anything with a two plus or a two minus charge. If we do the same, and that was, sorry, that would be an E here, not an H. If we do the same thing down here, then we get oxygen again with four bonds and a two plus charge. So no two plus charges. You will never see oxygen with a two plus charge or with four bonds. You will never see oxygen And of course, we've mentioned this already, carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-carbon um, carbon pi bonds create nucleophilic sites because they're electron rich. So pi bond, electron rich. We have one more example on the next page. We will finish that on Wednesday. But so pretty much chapter three except for applications, so soaps, and all of that kind of stuff will not be on the test. So up through chapter three.